newbies, I try and link something that's happened in the week to our speaker as a sort of bit of a launch pad, um, hopefully to join things up into the main events, the main conversation. And it was actually quite easy this week because um, Julian's going to be talking about David Hume. And as it happened last weekend, I was at an event at the home of one of David Hume's predecessors, a philosopher called Anthony Ashley Cooper. Now, if you haven't heard of David Hume, you're perhaps even less likely to have heard of Anthony Ashley Cooper. But he, Ashley Cooper, was actually said to be the, the most famous 18th century philosophy, philosopher. And he was, I think, an influence on David Hume. Um, I was at his old house, which is St. Giles House in Dorset, um, because of helping out on a weekend for a group called Doctors in Distress. And it was a sort of post-COVID meeting, given that we are moving into some sort of at least new COVID phase now. Um, and it was all about actually um, the enormous stress, in fact, that people in the health service are under, medics, nurses, and others. I mean, it's, it's bad at the worst of times, at the best of times, and, but now it really is quite shocking, actually. I hadn't quite realized. I mean, you read headlines and so on, but um, you know, in some NHS trusts, a third of the staff are off on various stress or other related conditions. I mean, it's really quite serious, and we were there to think about that. And the thing I wanted to pick up on, which I wondered if might be a link into this evening, was the doctors there particularly saying that one of the problems that they've realized big time through COVID is that we've developed the habit of kind of outsourcing all responsibility for our death and quite a lot of responsibility for our life onto organizations like the NHS. I mean, you don't often hear this because everyone loves the NHS and wants to thank the NHS, but they were saying this actually makes it really hard for a kind of pushback and the NHS to say, you're asking us too much almost by inviting us to take responsibility for, for your death. Um, and the link with Ashley Cooper and with David Hume is that they both um, were known actually, certainly David Hume, and I'm sure Julian will say about this, were known for having what you might call a good death. They embraced death. And I think the reason for that is that they knew what they thought a good life was. Strangely, a good death and a good life are often linked. And for Anthony Ashley Cooper, um, this was a real thing for him. He actually suffered from poor health all his life. Um, he wasn't very idle. Um, he was a high achiever, really. He died at the age of 42 and in that time had written enough and become well known enough to be the most famous philosopher in the 18th century. And um, that said, he had to retire from his public life because of his ill health and so did devote himself to writing, thinking about life and so on in this age of enlightenment. And if there was one thing which he really latched onto that he felt illuminated his life more than anything else, it was the theme of beauty. He reckoned that beauty is a powerful guide through life. And as he put it, if you trust what beautifies, life will become beautiful to you. Um, and he, he extended that even into difficulties in life, even to tragedies in life. He felt that beauty was a kind of transcendent quality that even with pain and suffering around, which he knew about, it opens you up to what's most human, in fact, at least some of the time. You know, suffering is always a tricky thing to talk about, but often it's in those moments that we, mo we know what's most valuable. Um, we know who we love the most, what we value the most, and so on. And he said, you know, I wanted to um, befriend the whole of my life, so I didn't become an enemy in part to myself. Um, you know, wanting certain parts of my life and not wanting other parts of life. Um, so he, he applied this kind of criteria of beauty, which he deeply trusted to the whole of his life. And he felt it gave him a good life and therefore led to a good death as well. Another way of putting it is that he thought the whole of life can be befriended. And alongside beauty, things like humour and friendship were important to him. He was actually the first 
writer to use the word humour in the modern sense, not of the medical humours as had been, but humour in the sense of wit or mirth. And he, he knew that that word wit has a kind of double edge. It means being amusing, but it also means being smart, actually. And there's some wonderful links that he drew out there. And, and I suspect, I mean, Julian may want to pick up on this, but that fed into David Hume's ideas as well. Um, this might all seem kind of lovely, you know, if you've got it, but what difference does it make in practice and how might it link to what the doctors were talking about? And I think that one key link is to think about education. I think one of the things which we have um, indirectly suffered from and that COVID has kind of exposed, and maybe more needs to be written and thought about this, is an education that is designed to help us succeed in life instrumentally, you know, get qualifications to get jobs, to enter the economic system and so on. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of good in that in many respects. But a Ashley Cooper was also known for a much broader sense of education, which was called Bildung, a German word. And actually it became very influential in continental Europe, this idea of Bildung. And it's really about developing your interests and passions, the appreciation of life. William Blake, actually, the English romantic poet, he picked up on it when he wrote about education and talked about being outside. And he meant literally outside in the countryside, but also kind of outside the narrow constraints of life. I mean, in order to discover a good life, befriend all things, that therefore also helps this thing that we so often seem to struggle with, the notion of a good death as well. Um, of course, I think this links very nicely to Idler ideas as well. I have actually written about Anthony Ashley Cooper in the Idler magazine, um, but you know, we at the Idler, I think, try and stand for this much broader sense of education and the sense that life can be appreciated, interests can be pursued for their own sake, not because they have instrumental value, and that passions and so on matter as well. Um, idling means having the time to do that, very often. So it's kind of nice to see Julian um, and that I was at Anthony Ashley Cooper's house by chance last weekend, who I think was an influence on David Hume, who he's going to talk about, but also with this application of where we are right now. I, I, I really took on board um, what these doctors were saying, this kind of slightly subtler argument that maybe we can start to address. We need to think about what a good death might be. I think it's deeply linked to what a good life might be. But Tom, I'll hand over to you. And I suspect these might be themes that um, Julian finds in his book on David Hume as well. Well, that's right, Mark. Thanks very much because uh, actually, well, it's a biography. And so towards the end of the book, we get a glimpse into how David Hume died, don't we? And he, he died in a very sort of cheerful manner, you say, Julian. But maybe we can come back to that um, and uh, sort of like rock through uh, his life and, and 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 the ideas of his that you that you're seeking to sort of um, resurrect in this book. I, I mean, I remember bumping into you at a, at a festival many years ago. Um, uh, you don't need any introduction, but you've written loads of books. You're you're a, a sort of public philosopher. You write in the newspapers, um, and and you often pop up at these festivals like How the Light Gets In and, and Edinburgh and so on. Um, and I said, Well, who's your favourite philosopher? And he said, Well, it's got to be David Hume. And I went, oh, um, and I had absolutely nothing to say because, I, you know, <clears throat> I hadn't read a single word or knew anything about it. I didn't even know he was 18th century. He was basically a, a, a contemporary of Dr. Johnson, wasn't he? Um, what, what was it that led you into him in the first place? And I imagine this book had quite a long gestation. Um, and why did you want to write a book that sort of, in a way, kind of removed him from academia and placed him into the world, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a long gestation and a, and a long story. It's interesting what you, when, when you said what my answer to the question was, I often say, you know, Hume and, and sort of Aristotle as a kind of a pair. I think they're kind of very much sort of cousins. They're both very kind of grounded. They're very much against the sort of excesses of, of their con contemporaries and near contemporaries. So Aristotle in lots of ways reacted against Plato and Hume reacted against sort of Descartes. And what they're reacting against is that kind of belief that a kind of pure rationality can make sense of the world and life without reference to experience. And, and they were much more prepared to accept the fact that actually making sense of the world is a much messier affair. There's much less certainty. 
but you know, we, but at the same time, we think as hard as we can. So I think what really attracts me to both Hume and Aristotle, apart from what they actually ended up concluding, I kind of think their approach is, is, is spot on, the money. And that's why I think that a lot of what, when we read them today, in both cases, there are certain aspects of their philosophy which have dated and which we don't necessarily agree with. But you, you don't disagree with, with the spirit of it. You don't disagree with, with where it's coming from. The approach, approach is right. And the idea of doing a book on him, I mean, the, the story of this is rather complicated and rather strange because what happened was I was approached by a South Korean publisher who were putting together a series of 100 books, which was going to be called A Journey Through, dot, dot, dot. And the idea was the books would be on philosophers, writers, artists, people. And by, by following them on a, a journey they took in their life, you would have an introduction to their thought. And, you know, this was one of those things. I'm a totally freelance writer, apart from a very tiny uh, position at the Royal Institute of Philosophy. At the time, I didn't even have that. And this was nice because they were paying just enough to make me think that, this could, I could justify the time it would take to do this book on Hume. They, Hume wasn't on their initial list, by the way, but I said he should be, and they said, okay. And, and what I wanted to do was, it was a commitment strategy, essentially, because although I loved Hume, like a lot of people I say I love, there's tons I hadn't read. You know, I say I love Aristotle, but I've only read a fraction of his output. You know, I love Kierkegaard, there's loads I haven't read. Um, you know, the, the same is true of virtually everyone that I admire and love to my great shame. So I thought, if I do this, it's a commitment strategy. I get to commit. I have a reason that I have to spend time reading all the Hume I've never read in my life. And I, I get to do a few little journeys as well. But the point is, the book we now have here, and here's the advert for it, The Great Guide, um, isn't exactly that book. Because what happened the, um, was... Can I just draw, draw attention to the, the, uh, the posture of your hero here? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, very, very much. Very much trying to catch your spirit there. Now, this isn't exactly the same book at all, because I, I found that, you know, I loved writing this book and I just found it really, really interesting. And I thought, you know, there was, it would be a shame if it just ended up being published in South Korea, but also the, it would be good to expand on it and perhaps move out of the, the, the strict format of their series. So what happened was Princeton University Press bought the rights, but I didn't, they didn't just take the manuscript. I worked on it quite a lot more with the with the editor there, an excellent editor there, Matt Rohal, and and we produced something which you know stands on its own two feet, um, and it is interesting because I think, as you say, Hume isn't that well known outside of academia, and in academia he's not really thought of as a practical philosopher. You know, what, he, what the subtitle is what David Hume teaches about being human and living well. I think a lot of academics would kind of like raise their eyebrows on that and go, well, you know, I think Hume can tell us a lot about the nature of causation and, and the self and mind, but living well. And I think the thing there to say is that partly what makes it work in that sense is it's looking not just at his work, but his work and his life. And also his work, his output, more than just those canonical texts we now read. His essays, which he published in his lifetime, which are not really studied at all now, in his correspondence and, his, and the letters. And you, you build up this rich picture of the philosopher. And I guess that's, that's something that may be changing now, but historically, in sort of Anglo-Saxon philosophy, people don't really do that. They focus in, they want to know what, show me the argument is their thing, show me the argument. And they don't really have much interest in zooming out and, and looking at the life, you know, generally, of course, there are exceptions to this. Yeah, and that's what's so nice about it. It's got that kind of novelistic sense. It's, it, is a, uh, it is a biography. Um, and he's a very likable person in your account of him. And his likability starts right at the beginning when you say that he, uh, well, firstly, he, he, he quit university. You said that was quite normal. Um, like you, he, he, he wasn't an official academic or anything, I don't think. I mean, you say actually he was one of the first people who lived by his own wits, a bit like Dr. Johnson. He, he, made, he made his living out of his writing, which is amazing. And he didn't have any official position. He wasn't a doctor at Oxford or anything like that. Um, like you, you're kind of out there, you know, living by your wits. You don't have a kind of regular mm. stipend. Um, what's so likable right from the beginning is that you say that he was going to study law but found it nauseous <laughs> um, and I'm sure that's <laughs> so it's like he just couldn't really stand to do that and he wanted to do something that was sort of fun and uh, alighted on philosophy and in a way that makes him a kind of an idler yeah no offense to any lawyers in the audience of course it just wasn't for him right um he didn't he didn't sort of not finish university in the sense that what happened at the time is it was very normal just to just to, you didn't really 
graduate, you just left. You didn't get a certificate or anything. That was very. They went at like twelve, didn't they? Sometimes. Yeah, and exactly. He didn't really like it, and he ended up saying, "There's nothing to be learned from a professor that you can't learn from a book." So that kind of, you know, puts yeah, because it, because the sort of the kind of thing that people might say today, actually. Yeah, and I think that's to be honest. I mean, it's not entirely true. There's something. There's sometimes a real benefit in having that real engagement with a good with a good teacher. But it's true that a lot of the time, you know, you, you're better off just reading a good, good book on a subject than sort of following some kind of uh, on, on a MOOC or, MOOC or something, whatever it is. Um, yes, and so he, he basically, you know, he 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 was. It's very difficult to, to talk about because obviously, in the context of his time, he belonged to that tiny fraction of the population who were. Uh, you know, had, had means and had money and most people were, were pretty poor. So he was in the privileged group, but he wasn't the richest of the rich. He, he had to sort of earn a living and he realised he had this responsibility. So he tried law. He came down to Bristol to try and work for a merchant. He lasted about three weeks there. Partly, it seems, because um, he insisted on correcting the, the, the English of the business owner because he thought it was rather um, inelegant and this was not appreciated by the merchant himself. And, you know, it, it was kind of, he had, he had a vocation, that's what it boiled down to. He wanted to be what he called a man of letters. And, you know, he tried other things, but he kept being pulled back to that. But, I mean, the interesting experience, which we might worth be talking about, particularly in the context of the idler, which is that although he comes across, and people who knew him as this very, very genial man, he had a kind of a, whatever, some kind of breakdown in his sort of late teens, in his, his, early, his early youth. And... It, which never recurred. But the point is this, he concluded that the, the reason was he had simply been too fervent in his work and his studies. You know, he was really keen to learn. and he Meaning he, he, was, he, really he was working too hard. He was working too hard. And he had this kind of breakdown. And, and there was this correspondence with some doctors and, you know, people refer to it as the disease of the learned. Apparently this was a very typical thing to do. Um, and, 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 but the reason is, it's not because, it's nothing sort of romantic about how the intensity of academic work you know, brings around mental crisis. It's simply the fact you're not going outdoors enough, you're not relaxing enough, you're not walking, you're not exercising, et cetera, et cetera. And, and he kind of realized this after a while. And from that point on, he always made it a point in his life to take time for relaxation, for walking, for company, for playing billiards or whatever it was. And, and, and backgammon, that did it, one of his really. favorites, yeah. And backgammon, backgammon, that's one, not billiards, of course, <laughs> backgammon. And so, he, um, and so he never had that, a recurrence of it ever again it was a really important well, lesson that, that was in, thanks to his that was thanks to his what we would um call in a less appealing way today work-life balance yeah exactly he appreciated that point the work-life balance and but not only that i think it's, it's more important than that it's not just about your well-being i think it's also there's a similar kind of version of that which is important to sort of doing good philosophy or good intellectual work because, you know, I think he believed that if you got too wrapped up in your theories and your ideas, you end up getting immersed in them and you, 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 you lose touch with reality in a sense. You need to sort of go back to the real world to sort of keep your philosophy grounded. And, and that, you know, so when, his, when he talked about cause and effect, which is, you know, can be a rather dry, abstract, metaphysical sort of issue, you know, he, 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 it was partly the, the cure for getting too sort of caught up in these tangles was to go and play the backgammon with his friends but I think that also meant that the conclusions he came to were you know he, he, he always knew that if you didn't come to a conclusion which in somehow reconciled philosophy with our experience of the world you, you had failed you know and any philosophy which sort of like asserts something which simply you, you, you cannot bring back to a, a, a fully lived life is, is a philosophy which has got to be flawed in some way. Now, I was quite interested to find out, Julian, that you say he was very much an anti-Stoic. You know, Stoicism mm, as yeah, a philosophy yeah. is sort of massive now. Um, yeah. It's a Silicon Valley philosophy. Every, every few months, there's another book about, you know, um, it picks us on the Stoicism and how Stoicism for the modern world and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's quite an attractive philosophy in some ways, um, but mm. it's pretty harsh. And that's, I think, what he was trying to, what, what he pointed out. Can you just sort of yeah, I think so. Now, I mean, th this is fun. This is fun because I mean, there's quite a lot of people who are kind of advocates of modern stoicism. I think Marx has been quite sort of enthusiastic about certain aspects of stoicism, shall we say, um, in in the past. And and, it's, and obviously they 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 read well. They a lot of their advice is very good. Yeah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But for my money, the bottom line is this: that um, the, the a lot of the stoic advice, if you take them as aphorisms and bits and pieces 
it can boil down to really good practical advice. You know, don't sweat the small stuff, keep things in perspective, accept there are certain things that are not in your control, don't try and control what you can't control. And all these things are very true and they're very wise. And people say, that's great, so the Stoics are fantastic. But I think, you know, if, if my view is that if you read the Stoics properly, and I have David Hume on my side in this, um, what the Stoics are ultimately trying to get you to achieve is to make sure your happiness and your well-being is not dependent upon anything external to yourself, right? Even, so even, it's all even the death of a child, your, your own child. Even the death of a child, yeah? yeah. I mean, that they obviously know that you're not going to achieve this degree of sagehood where you're you're literally not gonna be affected by that but that's kind of the ideal if you if you if you if you put these ideals into practice you wouldn't be bothered by the death of your child you would go so be it nothing lasts um everything goes nothing to do with me gov i can't stop it goodbye you know and 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 and, and you know and and so that, that's what they really were advocating and hume thought that was too harsh so what's interesting is you get a lot of things in hume which if you uh, read stoicism superficially or you've read some of the popular books, you might go, that sounds very stoic. But my controversial thesis, I'll keep repeating, um, and by, I should, I'll say something else in a minute, is that as far as I can see, everything the sto stoics say a lot of true things, but the true things they say aren't actually uniquely or distinctly stoic at all. And what's uniquely and distinctively stoical, which is not to make your well-being dependent upon anything external, is, is too harsh and wrong. Now, I should just say, footnote alert here, I know there are some advocates of stoicism today who will, who will say either that, that that's a misinterpretation of the Stoics or that you can dispense with that um, aspect of Stoicism and still retain something worthy of the name. So I would like to make it clear that, you know, this is, me and Hume um, do have people who disagree with us, but um, Hume's right, in my view. <laughs> now, <laughs> as you said, he, he's a sort of a moderate philosopher, perhaps not like the, the sexiest philosopher ever, um, a bit like Aristotle. Um, but I did like the bit about the middling state being the best. Could you expand on that? So, you know, he, 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 he does feel, I think he was sort of, he, had a, he felt he had a naturally cheerful temperament. Um, but he says, you know, it's not good to be poor because you're constantly worrying about money and uh, it's, just a, it's just a huge kind of energy sucker, really. Um, it's not good to be rich either because the rich spend too much time paying for or indulging in the luxuries. If, you, if you're in the middle, then yeah. you can count yourself to be quite lucky. And he also compares himself to other people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting too, isn't it? Because I think that we're often told the key to happiness is not to compare yourself to other people. <laughs> um, or if to compare yourself to other people, to only compare yourself to people um, less fortunate than yourselves as a kind of form of gratitude. Um, but yeah, no, he does, you, I mean, you've summed it up very well, so there's not really very much to add. But I think what it kind of shows, and I think this is where he's, he's very much like Aristotle, a lot of philosophers sort of have suggested that, you know, the ideal is to reach a kind of state of self-sufficiency where it really doesn't matter about your material conditions at all, you know. And I mean, and I think for Aristotle and Hume, it's, it's, I'm putting words into the mouth a little bit here. They're saying, obviously, if you find yourself in a position where you are very poor, you have no resources, obviously, um, you need to make the most of it and you need to recognise that there are lots of things of value around. But, but let's not pretend, <laughs> let's not pretend it isn't actually better to have a bit of comfort, a fireside you can read your book by. You know, so you say, as long as you've got a book, I mean, Hume says, as long as you've got a fireside and a book, you, you're happy, right? Well, a, a fireside and a, and a Wi-Fi connection, I suppose it would be yeah, now. Yeah, and a Wi-Fi connection. Now, fi but the fireside bit is important, right? Because if you pass someone in the street who's reading a novel, you don't think to yourself, oh, well, you know, they've got everything they need to be happy, haven't they? They've got the life of the mind, they've got their novel. It doesn't really matter that they're freezing to death and that they're eating scraps of leftover Greg sandwiches for dinner. They, they've got the life of the mind. You know, it's, uh, that's kind of a nonsense fantasy. But in a way, you know, the philosophers want to kind of, a lot of philosophers have wanted to kind of advocate that. So, but at the same time, obviously, the, you know, there's no point in getting rich and wealthy. And actually, it becomes a burden and it becomes a distraction if you, if you sort of like get too wrapped up in that. And Hume was very fortunate because actually, you know, if you read his letters, um, he, he's very concerned. He doesn't want to achieve that level of material comfort. But once he does, he, 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 you know, he's not striving for more. He's really happy with it. 
and there were lots of times where he he says you know there's this wonderful thing here where um actually this relates to the the quote you've claimed him as an idler and we ought to talk about that <laughs> um, but um, he wrote that about the time he was being encouraged to write more of his volumes of history because that's what made his money, his histories of England. And, uh, what, he and, and what he explained uh, why he wouldn't write any more, he said, because I'm too old, too fat, too lazy and too rich. Right now, I mean, it's not because he was actually rich in the, in, 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 a, in a sense that contemporaries say you are rich, but too rich in the sense that he had sufficient money that he didn't have to go out and write another book to pay the bills. And so for that point of view, he was too rich to have to do some work that he really didn't want to do. And that was good enough. You know. And he probably, he wasn't really that fat or that lazy either. He, but he, he had, again, it's another appealing aspect of his personality, I suppose, to, to call yourself fat, lazy and um, too rich. He was quite fat. He was quite was he? fat, but he wasn't yeah. lazy at all. No, he wasn't lazy. But I mean, so this goes back to the idler thing. And I know, you know, I've been, I've sort of, we've, we've crossed paths many times from the early days of the idler. And it's always this question, you know, for an idler, you seem to be very, very productive. And, and uh -huh, yeah. the point is, you know, and that's not actually a contradiction because the way you understand idling, it's not about not doing things. In some ways, it is about precisely about doing things, but it's the manner in which you, you do them. He, he worked hard. He kept working all his life. He was a constant editor and reviser of his books. Um, he replied in correspondence a lot. So yeah, he 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 did he did he did he did work hard. But he but as I say, he he did he did so in a way that he didn't run himself into the ground. And he 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 tried to focus on the things that most interested him, and not get distracted. He was tempted by things that would bring, um, you know, I don't know prestige. I mean, he did almost get a couple of positions at universities, but he was rejected because he's views on religion were too uh, controversial. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, he, 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 so it, it was work, but it was, it was focusing on what he thought kind of most mattered. And, and it was fun. A lot of bits where he goes to Paris. And uh, although, again, it's a bit like the anti-Stoic thing, you know, um, the ancient philosophers, the, the Christian leaders from France of Assisi, everything is vanity, you know, don't, don't enjoy adulation and all, all this sort of thing. But he gets so much adulation in France. I mean, he gets adulation from the king and the queen. And he does allow himself to enjoy it. And you think, yeah, what's wrong with that? You know, just like, enjoy it for a bit, David. I mean, you've earned yeah. it. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, he kind of, he had a, he had a sort of um, ambivalent relationship with crowds and company. Um, he liked people, he liked it, but he also craved solitude as well. And I think that's quite nice because, you know, he's living out attention that a lot of us have, you know, and I think it's a bit simplistic that we're nowadays encouraged to sort of like, if I, are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? And um, most people are a combination of those things. Or, or if they're not a combination of those things in the strict psychological sense of the word, it doesn't necessarily mean what it means. So, for example, I would say on, on that spectrum, I, I'm the introvert spectrum. But people will assume that means, oh, so you don't like company. And no, I do. I do like company. I do like people. I just like to be able to bugger off and leave them when, when I've had too much. And I don't want it in my face all the time. Mm. Hume, Hume found the adulation and stuff a bit over the top and a bit embarrassing. But, yeah, obviously, he did enjoy it. And, and I think people, most people would, wouldn't they? You know, but I don't think it let him become arrogant. You know, he didn't, no, it didn't go to his head. He, he, he was enjoying no, it, but exactly. he was also observing it from the outside and finding it quite amusing. Yes, exactly. And I think, and I think that's the point, you know, and I think that if, if, you, if you're lucky to, um, you know, receive any kind of praise or, or stuff, I think it should be possible both to enjoy it, but also to be mindful that one shouldn't put too much store on it. You know, I mean, <laughs> I suppose the thing is, you know, if you write books, for example, um, uh, you, know, you make a list of people. I mean, I can make a list of plenty of people who have sold tons of books and or got huge followings and everything who I personally, you know, if I'm honest, I don't think they're that good, really, you know. Um, so if I were to sell loads of copies and receive a lot of adulation, it doesn't mean I'm any good, right? <laughs> it just means it just means people like it. And that's yeah. nice. That's yeah. nice. But it doesn't make me great, you know. It also, wouldn't make it great. Uh, we shouldn't feel bad if we feel bad when things have gone badly either, you know. Um, because the, the other aspect of that stoic thing is that, you know, when things go really well, keep detached from it. And when things go badly or, you know, you feel an attack on your ego, I often feel it's, you know, it, it's okay to sort of 
allow yourself to feel sorry for yourself for a bit. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, not, not, not exactly. Not yourself. And then go it's, back it's to that being human. I mean, pride as well. I mean, he talks about pride and he says, look, if you think about it, you know, um, if, if there were certain values or things that you esteem, right, that, that, and, and, then, and then you behave or, or you do something in a way that is in accordance with those values, it's almost like in virtue of valuing that, you are going to feel a sense of what he calls certain sort of pride. It's kind of unavoidable and, and perfectly fine, you know. Um, so again, it's when pride just tips over into that overweening sort of arrogance and conceitedness, that's mm. what you've got to watch out for. Yeah. So he, know, was, he, he is that philosopher of moderation, which you said at the beginning, which is so important. Now, he was a contemporary Gillian of Dr. Johnson, wasn't he? But I, I don't see any evidence that he, he met him, although he did, he did meet Boswell. But actually, mm. they remind me a little bit of each other. And one of the things I think your book is really good at is um, celebrating that 18th century way of writing. It's quite funny. You know, he talks about his swelling belly, for example, when, when he gets fat. Um, and they, 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 they had a sort of playfulness with language. I don't really know how to describe it. You, you bring it out really well, quite long sentences. Um, do you think he knew Johnson? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there is any evidence. I mean, he certainly didn't know him well, because the thing is, you know, he did correspond with lots of people. The people he really knew, you know, like, you know, like Adam Smith, for example, he had a very long friendship with Adam Smith, a very, very good book written about that. Um, I suppose he wasn't really so. in London much, was he? I mean, he, he didn't like London. He, he, he liked no, he didn't like London. The, um, what did he call them? The, the, uh, uh, the, Oh, I, there's a phrase he used, um, uh, um, barbarians of the Thames or something. He thought, he thought yeah. Londoners, I mean, you look, I mean, Londoners may be different now. No offence to any Londoners. I've lived in London myself. I, I, I like it a lot. But yeah, he I thought they did that you, you, you yourself live in Bristol, don't you, Julian? I live in Bristol, yeah. So therefore, you know, I don't know. I can, but, anyway, but yeah, Edinburgh, Paris, you know, he just thought these were much, much more civilised places. And Edinburgh was extraordinary. You know, it was a real intellectual hub. And it was also small enough. You know, people would bump into each other and they had these sort of literary societies. It was kind of great. It has to be said, you know, caveat time, of course, if you were a man. I mean, it was a very, very male-dominated society and women didn't get a look in. In, in France, in the salons, it was slightly more complicated because the, the salons were generally run by women and they clearly did play a role. But they, they kind of didn't get the same intellectual kudos uh, as the men, for sure. And again, I think one of the things I do try and stress in my book is that, you know, it's always a huge mistake to sort of idolise anyone. Hume was a great philosopher, a lovely human being. But, you know, was he flawed? Absolutely. Um, a lot of it to do with his time. And, you know, he, did, he, didn't, he didn't manage to rise above that. If you look about his attitude to, to women, it's certainly not um, horribly misogynistic, but he had these stereotypes about them having... Um, you know, he kind of praises their intelligence in ways which actually are kind of a bit backhanded. He says, you know, for example, that women are much, 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 much better at men uh, being able to judge the literary quality of things like novels and everything, which is which seems like a kind of compliment, but it's again, it's it, it, the, the the flip side of that is it's suggesting they're not really up to sort of the hard disciplines, are they? You know, stories stories for the ladies. Now, um, what for, about the, the issue of slavery? Because that was an issue at the time, um, and uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh well, they didn't know what they're talking about. It was a different time; they had different attitudes. But that's mm. not actually true because you look at the, a simple comparison between uh, Johnson's attitude to slavery and Boswell's. Mm. So Dr. Johnson, you know, he was well known for saying, here's to the next slave uprising in the, middle, in the West Indies. Um, of course, it was the time of the American Revolution. So, and he said when, when America was trying to free itself from the grip of George III, um, because they didn't want to pay tax to England, and um, uh, and Dr. Johnson said things like, how is it that we um, hear the loudest whelps of liberty from among the drivers of the slaves? You know, mm. and so he was, he, he, what I'm trying to say is that the, the, the moral option um, to be anti-slavery was there and had been there, you know, mm. uh, for centuries before. Um, do you know where Hume stood on that sort of spectrum? Did he not involve himself in those sort of moral he, issues he, he was he, he wasn't involved in campaigning or, or that kind of thing he was uh, he said very explicitly that slavery was awful it was terrible he was against slavery um 
But um, in practice, did that mean he completely sort of distanced himself and divorced himself from practices? No. There was a letter uncovered only I think last year or so, I think, which, which showed that, I mean, they encouraged a friend, asked him to ask a friend to make an investment, you know, that kind of thing in a plantation and he did and that he would have known that plantation involved slave labor i think the way he sort of stood with slavery was um to be honest i can compare it i think to the way a lot of people now stand on animal welfare and that includes a lot of philosophers right they believe it to be um animal welfare to be terribly wrong there's huge problems with it etc etc but they kind of i don't know they just still kind of assume that the system is the way it is and that they don't they're not motivated to take strong action against it and so you know i i i i i'm, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan but i call myself conscientious omnivore so you won't find me eating meat unless i know it's high welfare meat but i i i, yeah, I meet people philosophers and i meet philosophers i've met loads of philosophers who've said they're absolutely convinced the moral arguments for vegetarianism for but yeah it just, for some reason it doesn't when you eat meat, as long as you sort of met the parents and you know how it was brought up, that's yeah. okay. That kind of thing, yeah. But anyway, so but he was he so he was very much against slavery, but it can't be said that he was enlightened about you know uh, racism issues. Now, this wasn't a core part of his think, thinking at all. The, the thing that caused the controversy is a footnote in which which starts with the words "I am apt to suspect." So it's kind of like an aside, mm. Hume kind of saying. I don't know this, but it seems to me, based on the achievements of different civilizations, that you know these these sort of non-white people, of which Negroes are just one, type, they're just not quite you know up to up to the same scratch as the whites. Now that's what he thought. Now that's obviously from a contemporary point of view abominable. It's not inevitable he would have thought that. There are people like James Beatty who who who, who criticise him very strongly for it. But at the same time, I think so. I think that we have to sort of do this delicate balance. I think what people want to do is they want to sort of say hero zero, hero villain. Mm. I think we need to balance of saying that this is a stain on Hume's character. It's definitely a mistake. He got it wrong. But given the context of his time, given things, and, and the, Tom Devine, the Scottish historian, is more forthright than this. He says that people who criticise Hume are just being completely anachronistic and don't really understand what's going on. I, I don't think it's quite as straightforward as that because some people didn't. So. He is a product of his time, so so we, we don't think this proves he's a villainous, awful person. But it's a, it's a stain, it's a failing, and and I think if ever we're going to hold up anyone as someone as like a great guide, someone to follow, it's really important to sort of uh, always recognise the fact that n no one is a complete model to follow. Gandhi was a racist, for example. You know, Gandhi said lots of terrible things about about the blacks. I mean, if you look at historical figures, pretty much, you know, uh, who, who's left who you can say is a has got no serious stain against their character. It all goes down to Nelson bleeding Mandela, doesn't it? I mean, the, 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 the only person who keeps, comes close to having a reputation that, it, it, and, and, yeah, deservedly, what, but what a rarity that is. And interestingly, I think one of, the, one of the little ironies, which is quite amusing, which shows how dangerous it is to sort of like, try to hold everyone to an absolute standard, is that the original campaign to rename David Hume Tower in Edinburgh, uh, take his name off it because they thought this was honoring a racist, suggested naming it instead against the uh, founder, you know, the first president of, of Free Tanzania, I, I believe. And this person turns out to have been a horrible homophobe, right? So they quickly withdrew that. You know, if it, it's, you know, I, I don't like that nobody's perfect shoulder shrugging thing, you know, hey, well, nobody's perfect, so let them off. But um, you don't have to sort of again it's, it's not a case of this person uh, this this proves he's a villain and therefore let's let's burn him or no it's okay there's nothing wrong we, we can be a bit more subtle than that can't we we can uh, let's just go back to his death because that's how we open this conversation and mark was talking about death uh and there's a lovely passage about how he died he was so cheerful about it he didn't even want to have a long life i mean <laughs> that's, that's actually quite an unusual thing to say because today it's actually kind of given that uh, you know the great thing about the modern world is that we all live so long. It's fantastic, and Stephen Pinker, etc. And life expectancy gets longer and longer. Isn't that great? You know, um, we and we don't really question that. And he was saying, no, I've, I've had enough. I don't want to be old. It's going to be a nightmare. And you know, 
Um, I've had a great life and I'm sort of ready to die fairly soon. I'm going to be quite cheerful about it. Yeah, no, that, that is true. And I think it is, it is true. I mean, it's interesting if you look at, again, these statistics, these of, of like when they measure subjective well-being, subjective perceptions of happiness. And there's this really encouraging idea that actually people get happy as they get older, except when they start to get really old. And then, again, on average, you know, it, it can be really, really tough getting very old. And you meet, to be honest, you meet plenty of people who say stuff like, you know, oh, I've had enough, oh, I'd like to go now. I wish someone could, if someone knows, there was some foreign language film about five years, ten years ago, it's a very slow film. And I remember there's this lovely character, this woman who 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 was who was complaining that every night she goes to bed saying to God, you know, take me now. And every every morning she wakes up furious that God hasn't heeded her call. If anyone remembers the name of the film, please do tell me. Um, but he was he was cheerful. And there's this lovely story I think Adam Smith tells in which he kind of has this imaginary conversation with Charon, you know, the, the boatman who takes people across the sticks, in which he imagines, you know, giving all the reasons why, you know, it's too soon to take him, you know. That I, I still have I still have to persuade people of the truth of these various doctrines. And you know, and you know, and the reply being you you arrogant buffoon, you know, you never persuade them if you gave you another hundred years, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And 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 you know and, and complaining he hadn't had enough he's had a lovely life, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So he comes to the conclusion that if he was to sort of have this debate with Chowan, he actually would have no good reason. He would have no reason to complain that his time was up. Now, of course, you know, he, that, he, what, he did have a great life. He had a very fortunate life. He had a blessed life. So he was kind of right to conclude that. But, you know, you don't have to have a life as blessed as Hume's to sort of um, believe that nonetheless you've been remarkably fortunate. And temperamentally, oddly enough, I've felt this for a very, very long time. Um, I remember now how I, I was in my, must have been in my 30s, uh, maybe even early 30s or mid 30s, when I had a scare. I had a scare in the sense that I found out on a Friday that I had to go into the uh, National Neurological Hospital, whatever it's called, on the Monday. And I knew from the build up on this what that meant was they had found a brain tumor. It was, it was like pre internet and everything. And like, it was really weird. I got the message and then couldn't speak to anyone until the Monday. So I had the whole weekend knowing I was going to hospital very, very quickly because I had some kind of brain tumor. I had no idea how serious it was or anything. But of course, at such moments, you do think, you know, and I, I, I honestly thought, you know, if, if, if I'm unlucky and I go, I really couldn't complain. I've been a, a white man in a rich country in the 20, 20th and 21st century. I've, I've seen more places than, than, you know, my mother saw in her entire life or my father for that matter. I've done things, you know, okay, sure, but bl bloody lucky, you know. And, um, and I genuinely think that would have been true. It's not that I wouldn't want to, I, of course I wanted to live more. Of course I did, there was so much more to do. But how could I have complained uh, if I'd been cut short of that life when I'd had so much, when so many people's lives are just struggle, struggle, struggle from birth till death. And I think Hume also kind of saw that, absolutely and exp expressed it much more eloquently than I could. There's something a bit Socratesian, is that the right word? Socratic, I think I should say, um, <laughs> about his kind of willing embrace of death, although of course he wasn't- Well, uh, yeah, but the big difference is this. For Socrates, he embraced his death because he thought his soul was going to leave his body, and so he'd live on. Hume thought it was the end. Uh, and that's why Boswell came, Boswell came up to sort of like see him, because Boswell wanted to see how an, how an atheist would die. Because he was sure that he was sure he was going to see squirming and angst, and he was really he was really disturbed that that's not what he saw. It really shook him that Hume was so calm. So in that sense, it's completely not like Socrates. Socrates thought, "Well, this body is a pain in the neck. Yeah, well, I'll get rid of it now. I shall live in the pure realm of the spirit and all that stuff." So yeah, whereas Hume thought, "That's it. That's like I'm off." Right. Okay. Well, so he was, he was more of a. Sorry, we'll, we'll go to questions in a minute, Victoria. I'm sure there's uh, questions coming up and. Um, Mark would like to interject, but I, I suppose in a way, you know, he was more of an Epicurean in the sense that the Epicureans believed in the theory of atoms and, you know, um, you might as well just enjoy yourself here and now. Not that they embrace luxury, but mm. uh, I think they, I think they, they, they weren't 100% atheists, but they were as, as atheist as, as he got, more or less, I think, in the ancient world. Um, and the Stoics were, were very kind of god aware or god god fearing no not god fearing but you know whatever the word would be so i mean do you think and, and then the other thing you say when he dies um is that he takes up cookery 
Okay, just answer that very quickly because I know I'm sure there are loads of questions. <laughs> yeah, in later life. Well, I mean, he had he had he moved home. He had a new home built for him in what was the we now call the new town of Edinburgh. And he, he said he needed this new house because um, his old one wasn't large enough for him to practice the culinary arts. And he liked to cook. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting when you read things like this, you do wonder whether you're reading it anachronistically. When he said he liked cooking, did he like giving recipes to his housekeeper or did he actually cook himself? But I think it sounds like he did cook himself. And, if in, and even if he didn't, he clearly took a very deep interest in everything. And he made some stuff which was the, the talk of the town. Some visiting captain was still talking about his sheep's head broth a week later, which <laughs> sounds very unlikely. If you've seen the recipe, it would... I, know, I, I read the recipe. I'd like to try it. You should do a follow-up book, you know, um, yeah. David Hume's uh, Home Cookbook, or like a sort Absolutely. of, like, like you know, you've now reintroduced uh, him as a sort of practical philosopher. Um, yeah. Now perhaps you can reintroduce him as a sort of a Jamie Oliver of his day. Yeah, pucker. That's all I can say to that. <laughs> Mark, would you like to uh, ask Julian um, a philosophical yeah, yeah. query based on I mean, the work? There's a huge bit of me that I'm right? okay, screaming you know, back and defend Socrates on his deathbed. Mm. Yeah, of course you easy. do. Of course you do. But uh, I, th I think that, I, th I actually think they 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 deaths can be compared because they both believed knowing what they have reckoned life had taught them that 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 seems to me to be the common thing that, that even the yeah. ultimate test if you like um their philosophy stood up which is mm. really the test especially when you know philosophy is all very well having a good argument but does it get mm. into your heart and soul sort of thing not that yeah. you would have believed in your soul but we won't go there but what i did want to, what i did want to um ask you about that I, I do you think that part of david hume's problem is that he's been a bit weaponized particularly in recent times. And this does touch on, you know, recent disputes about atheism and all that. Because if you do get into David Hume, the one thing you'll probably come across is some screaming atheist saying, extraordinary things require extraordinary evidence and all that kind of stuff, which is then, a trip. well, I mean, I think Hume did say it somewhere. But what you've shown is that he says so much more. And, and, I, and I sort of feel that, that it's a shame when that's all that is kind of known about him. Um, yeah, so you weaponise this in, as part of the kind of religious bashing um, brigade. No, I agree, and it's actually completely inaccurate to say that. I mean, Hume was known as the great infidel, and he clearly could be very, very critical. He said very critical things of, of religion, but when he was being very critical of religion, he was being critical of certain varieties of it, particularly the more do the dogmatic kinds and uh, the, the puritanical kinds. But he was absolutely not. So, so one thing is that he would, there's a sense in which from a technical point of view, you wouldn't even say he was an atheist. He was an atheist in the sense that for him, God's existence was just uh, you know, irrelevant to him. He just, he, he didn't see any reason to think God existed. So he lived his life without it. But he didn't have that absolute dogmatic insistence that God didn't exist. And there's a story told of him go, when he, in Paris, at a dinner hosted by Baron Dolbach of Hume saying that he had never met an atheist in his life. And the people around the table said, well, look, there are, there are 14 here, 10 of us are atheists, and the other four haven't yet made up their mind. Um, so I think he, was, he wasn't into that at all, into that dogmatic kind of atheism. And that's demonstrated by the fact that his, his constant friendships and um, correspondences with, um, with, with clergy people and something. I, 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 by the way, I have this nominal, I, I never remember the names, um, he, he, in Paris, he met the very famous American writer and clergyman. Can you remember his name? And anyway, I can't remember now. And well, Frank, thank you, Franklin. No, not Franklin. But anyway, but anyway, yeah. He, and 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 it's interesting enough that the gossip was that these two had feuded, and that they had had this big fight about religion because that's what people expected. Hume, the great infidel, but and it's absolutely not true. Both of them wrote stuff to say actually we had a lot of good fun. Uh, we had a bit of fun sparring, as friends do, but we enjoyed things. He, he, he wrote his early treatise in La Fleche in the south of France, where um, he chose it because there was a Jesuit monastery nearby, which had a, fun, a great library. And Jesuits were great scholars. And he would use their library and chat with them and talk with them. Um, there was another clergyman who he was so close with that at some point there was some talk of, you know, um, Hume going to live in his house or vice versa, you know. So he, he just had this really open, friendly, non-dogmatic, non-aggressive attitude to religion. He certainly, you know, he, there's no way he could be claimed 
for for the, for, as a, by the new atheists as one of their own. He's a much more. He, he was a skeptic. He was a skeptic, but again, there's a particular form of skepticism. And you know, in, in, in the inquiry, in the uh, inquiry concerning human understanding, he 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 ends you know by distinguishing between these different forms of skepticism and how certain forms of skepticism become absolutely destructive because they they leave you with nothing. And he he, he advocates what he called this mitigated skepticism whereby you use, in a sense, the, your awareness of the inability to demonstrate things beyond doubt, et cetera, et cetera. Not as a reason to suspend belief, but as a reason to hold your beliefs lightly and undogmatically and to have that kind of open-mindedness about yourself. Mm. And, and that's, that's mm. really, you know, really important. So, so his skepticism really was a, his skepticism was a sort of um, uh, revolt against uh, ideological tyranny. Um, because he knew that the sort of you know the people who sort of severely convinced that they're right um, and don't listen to anyone else are probably the most dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, and and he, and it also led to things like you know factionalism. He really hated factionalism. He hated any of that kind of like you know excessive tribalism and everything. So again, he would be fairly appalled by various things happening today. Have we got some audience questions? Yes, um, Rudy's waiting to ask his question. Rudy Narendran. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. Uh, hi, sorry, Victoria, can you hear me? Hi, Rudy. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Rudy. Can't oh. see you. We'd much rather see you if we could. Oh, I'll give it a go, OK? Give it a go. Yay! Uh, hi, Rudy. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. I was really interested to listen to. Um, Julian, I just want to ask the question whether your book will explore connections between Hume and other philosophers. Uh, so notably, uh, philosophers such as Kant, uh, to whom Hume has been regularly compared to in academic literature and popular fiction, um, whereas there are other naturalist philosophers such as Nietzsche, who are similarly misunderstood and seemingly ignored apart from a few choice academic texts. Um, I think I have to disappoint you there, Rudy, I'm afraid. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't really talk, I think I don't talk at all about philosophers who came after Hume. I mean, Hume clearly did have a huge impact on Kant. So very famously, Kant said that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers, was this very famous phrase. The idea being that Hume's scepticism really, really shook Kant. And these interesting example here have temperament in philosophy. Hume's scepticism was something that he could sort of live with and be comfortable with. Whereas Kant, Kant was horrified, you know, <laughs> for Kant, if there's no way of establishing the firm foundations of knowledge, then it's the end of the world. I, so I've got to go and fix what Hume has, 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 has um, buggered up. So no, I don't. And, and to be honest, the whole approach isn't to get into that kind of really um, scholarly kind of approach, which, which is partly because of my own limitations, you could say this partly because I think that that's the kind of thing that it's so easy to get sucked into. So I mean, one review I had a very nice review of the book, and it mentioned I, I don't it was just a, I don't know if it's a comment or a criticism. It seemed more of a comment than a criticism, that I didn't really bring out the fact that there are all these sort of different interpretations of Hume's views and and views attributed to Hume which aren't really Hume's. And I guess I just didn't have an interest in writing a book which was going to talk about those debates you know and in a way so, so 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 people who do know about them they might say well this is very strange you know Pagini hasn't sort of gone into that at all but I'm thinking what, what's interesting about Hume for someone who knows nothing about Hume and is interested in the issues Hume is talked about and I'm going to write about them. Brilliant. So you need to read a different book unfortunately Rudy if you want to know about human Kant or human Nietzsche. Rudy do you have something yeah, to work so. on that yeah he's ob you've obviously read well, well, I I mean, uh, I think, so I'm watching this with my girlfriend and we were just discussing kind of um, comparisons between human nature, but I feel like that would go off on quite a tangent for us, so I'm happy to kind of leave <laughs> we it could there go. And go I'd like to bring, <laughs> I think we'll stick on that question. We've got another, I'm just going to say it for him. Paul has asked whether um, all philosophers, and, and it's another sort of comparison really. He says, aren't, aren't all philosophers introverts? And um, I thought, Mark, you probably would have something to come back on that. And you might have something to say about the link to Kant as well. Well, I mean, just actually, Julian kind of said it um, mm, when he, mm. uh, because, it, you know, Jung, it's Carl Jung that invents this phrase, introvert and extrovert. And this is my beef on the thing, is that Jung actually said these are two kind of like movements of your mind. 
that you kind of reach out into the world and then you need to return to yourself to become a whole person. And I think Jung would have been absolutely horrified if he thought that that idea had been turned into a kind of template and you're either one or the other. And Julian, I think, sort of said more or less that earlier on, actually. And you can't, you can't think about the world without stepping into the world. <laughs> I know that armchair and philosopher often get put together, but that's not a real place at all. Yeah, very good. Yeah, Julian, agreed? Yeah, no, I do, I do agree. I mean, it's interesting. I think the thing is that people often... You know, speculating about the, the personalities of, of historical figures or philosophers and writers is always very, very difficult. One, one often just doesn't know. And clearly, if you go to philosophy conferences, I mean, there are quite a lot of people who are quite keen to stay in the bar until past midnight, which would suggest that kind of more extrovert desire to, to get your energy from being around people rather than being by yourself. Um, I think that, you know, to be a philosopher or writer of any kind, you have to have uh, I, I, you have to be very comfortable and happy spending a lot of time by yourself and your thoughts. But um, so again, I think I think really that's the point. It's, it's uh, uh, probably probably they almost all have these strong in, introvert tendencies, which are highly developed. But whether that means they're not also extrovert, I think depends a lot. And some some really quite are. I mean, I don't. I always feel bad at remembering sort of gossip and biographical <laughs> details about philosophers but i'm sure there have been some philosophers who are quite well known as kind of um uh party types shall we say uh, our, our, our regular um viewer straight listener julian has accused me of pronouncing your surname wrong correct well done who who was that that's paul blezard who um we always well uh, thank for his uh, pedantry well, no, too right. I wasn't going to say anything earlier because I, yeah, well, I always say if I don't, if I don't speak, if I don't say beforehand, I can't blame it because almost everyone says Bagini and it is in fact Bagini. Oh. And the other thing is now here's another trivial fact for you. Why is it? Can someone explain to me why when I tell people it's actually Bagini, so many people say, oh, I thought the double G made it hard. And if I say to them, um, I didn't, well, I, I, are you familiar with the phonetical rules of Italian? <laughs> they sort of look a bit embarrassed. <laughs> it's, it's funny I'm how people. I'm very people, familiar with the phonetical rules of Italian. Well, you might be, but yeah, people, people invent. They, they, yeah, they basically mispronounce it, but then they, they kind of feel there must be some reason why they've said that. You know, they, they so they invent oh, on the hoof. Yeah. They invent on the hoof a phonetical rule for why they mispronounced it rather than just accepting the fact I got it wrong I don't know how it's pronounced yeah. there's no reason the way you should know how it's pronounced it's not your fault I don't mind <laughs> this, uh, this problem must have so philosophical Julian Tom you could go on I know but we have reached the end oh yeah <laughs> um, and uh, we've got messages um, Julian saying uh, we they could uh, our guests from our guests saying that they could listen to hours of this thank you so much for coming and fascinating us all. I'm going to no, ask you. everybody... I took, I took your drink with the idler very literally, so I have been... Oh, good. Well, oh no, yes, you, good. Could you just tell us what you are drinking now, Julian Baggini? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's an Italian red, but I actually don't know exactly which one because I opened it in a bit of a hurry. You, yeah, it didn't give you much time, did we? No. Um, Julian, tell us why you have chosen the song we're going to play out to. And well, then I'm going to set it up. I thought I wanted to, I wanted, you know, what could fit in with this? And I had a real struggle to think what would fit in because most, you know, most songs are about like love and Hume was a bachelor his entire life. They're about misery and Hume wasn't very miserable. Um, they're about contemporary political issues, not much to say there. So I thought, yeah, what, what can really, and I thought something Scottish and I thought, you know, but I couldn't think of a big country song that was suitable. So in the end, I thought, well, hang on, let's just get something, you know, a something really nice. This is Kate Bush, and it's the, the sensual world. And I just thought, because, you know, uh, Hume isn't a sensualist in that way that perhaps Kate Bush is, you know, music, dance, movement. But he, you know, he, he believes in, 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 in the, sen the sensual world is the world that we inhabit, and he embraced it in his way, you know, through the culinary arts rather than the musical ones. Uh, but also, it's a great tune. Brilliant. Well, we're going to play the sensual world in a second. But first, could everybody please unmute and give Tom, Mark, and especially Julian, a massive great big round of applause. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. 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 